Will you pray with me? Our Lord, our God, we come before you today seeking your presence that we might understand your word, that we might have that word live in our hearts so that we might go out and through our deeds be an example of a blessing to all nations. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to pick up the scripture lessons a little, a little bit later in this, so um, I didn't want you to think I like, skipped over the scriptures. Um, so in our story that we have been journeying together in, we pick up with our sympathetic hero, Moses, who had been living this double life. He was a Hebrew child who was raised by an Egyptian princess, and he tries to make his chops with his people as he goes out and he sees an Egyptian taskmaster and he murders that taskmaster and, and then because of that action ends up having to flee out into the wilderness and ends up becoming this obscure shepherd who is called out by God only to go back to Egypt, back to his people to bust them out of Egypt with a foreshadow of Christ's sacrifice on the cross that will conquer all death. And then he leads these people into the Sinai wilderness, millions of them, he's leading them into this wilderness so that they might receive additional instructions from God, a God who is crazy in love with these people who are continually stiff-necked and disobedient and rebellious and stubborn, especially to God's approach to life. And so God gets them in this Sinai wilderness and he says, road trip, road trip. We're going on a road trip. Because from God's perspective, he wants to fulfill those promises that he had made to these people's ancestors that they would inherit this promised land that they would be the nation that is the example to all other nations and that they would be a blessing to the nations surrounding them. God wants to fulfill those promises and he's excited about what they're going to see on the way but the people of Israel, the chosen people, all they can see is that they're hot and they're tired and they're dirty and the food is the same old, same old. And they're stuck in the back seat of the family station wagon on the vinyl seats in the middle of summer next to their brother who smells like cheese whiz. And they're going along, and mom and dad are pointing out all the things to see, and all they care about is their Wi-Fi at the motel. This is where we find God and the Israelite people. They're on a road trip. Now, I know road trips. It became my niche in youth ministry, planning and leading trips with senior high youth close by and far away up and down the spine of california up to washington across the united states and back without gps that was my niche and that's what i did so i know road trips and i understand god's excitement about what was coming next the careful planning with that triple-a triptych the pouring over the maps the going over and imagining 
every detail possible, doing dry runs, trying to figure out and anticipate what would happen, the preparation and the calculations and the impatience of it all. I know about the exhilaration of seeing the New York skyline from the windshield of a 15-passenger van that you have driven 3,000 miles across the United States and you realize you have made it. And then remembering you have to drive back. <laughs> I know about taking wrong turns in Philadelphia and driving through neighborhoods that would set your hair on fire. I know about changing it up at 4 a.m. in Kansas City when you realize, it, one, it's 90% humidity at 4 a.m., and you realize that the hundreds of pounds of sticks and twigs and branches that you piled up on one sidewalk because during the brutal winter that year it knocked over so many of these and people had to have them cleared out because the waste management was only coming once to pick it up. I know what it's like to make the decision to have everybody up at 4 a.m. and move all those sticks to the other sidewalk because you put them in the wrong place to begin with. I know about road trips, and I know about are we there yet, and he's touching me and eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches again at 10 p.m. I get it. And that is where we find Moses and the people of God when we pick up the story in the book of Numbers. If you read chapter 6 in the story, guess what? Congratulations, you have read portions of the book of Numbers. You've probably not done that before. Because even in seminary, you don't do that. <laughs> but you can pat yourself on the back. You've made it through some of the most difficult scripture there is. Moses wants to get the people to the promised land. The promise of the covenant. But the people refuse to see their future, and they are focused instead on the lack of comfort and the lack of food and how they just feel physically. So early on, they start complaining to Moses. They complain about the hardships of the trip. And they actually start reminiscing about the good old days in Egypt when they were slaves. And they whine and they complain, but there's no cheese. It's only manna to go with the wine. And then there's that tabernacle. They got to put it up, and then they got to take it down, and they got to move it to the next location, and then they got to put it up again. Well, who's going to sign up for that duty? So they keep complaining. And they complain about the food. Manna, manna, manna. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> they don't have a variety in their diet right now. All they have is this sweet coriander bread. It's like, I don't know about you all, when you're in college and you're eating a lot of top ramen and macaroni and cheese, it's that no variety in your diet because that's all they got on the bargain aisle. And so the people complain about the food. And then they start in on the leadership. Even Moses' brother and sister get in on the leadership complaints. His own administration has now become disillusioned. And the whining and the complaining just becomes habitual. It's white noise in the background running constantly, and over time, it begins to affect the Israelites' viewpoint and their attitude toward just about everything. And they arrive at a place 
of complete distrust in God. In the middle of the book of Numbers, the Israelites make their most egregious wrong turn. Moses sends out 12 spies, one from each tribe that we know of the sons of Jacob. He sends out one spy from each one, and they go out to survey the promised land. They are on the edge, the border, looking over into the promised land, and they send out 12 spies. And they come back, and they make reports. Ten of them report back that while the land is beautiful and wonderful and looks desirable, that there are giants in the land and we simply can't take it. Only two out of those ten report back and say, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, there's giants in the land, but God is with us and so we can take the land. And Moses does his best at convincing the people to trust God. But instead, they rebel. Instead, they choose not to trust Moses, not to trust God, and not to continue into the promised land. And this causes a 40-year detour. Now they're on road trip for good. Now they're really in those vans, and they got to make the best out of 40 years, two generations worth of people wandering about in the desert. The book of Numbers is a travel log of these people who do actually transform from their very hardened hearts to a place where they are ready to trust God again. The book of Numbers, Numbers means census. It's an accounting of the people of God. He, in Hebrew, they call this book In the Wilderness. And it is a difficult book to slog through. All of us that meet on Tuesdays over at Zito's to talk about the upcoming lesson, all of us agreed this week this was a difficult chapter to get through. Numbers is hard to plow through. It's a dense and disheartening accounting of a stubborn and rebellious people. But on closer examination, we recognize that wilderness is a powerful metaphor for describing the experience of many people and many communities. There's an early theologian named Origen, he was like third century, and he wrote a series of sermons on the book of Numbers. Using the book of Numbers, he did a series of sermons, that's courageous. But he said this about the book of Numbers. If the book of Numbers is read to someone, they will judge that there is nothing helpful, nothing of remedy for his weakness or benefit for the salvation of his soul. He will constantly spit them out as heavy and burdensome food. But for Origen himself, the book of Numbers was filled with insight and wisdom and spiritual sustenance for anyone who had a hunger for God's word, for a hunger for God's guidance in the wilderness that we call the journey of life. So here is this rich, gritty, jarring tale that confronts our sensibilities and yet resonates at a basic level with our own wilderness experiences. 
While the book of Numbers is hard sometimes for our head, our heart knows what it's like to be in the wilderness. The ugly battles, the distrust, the disrespect, the, tr the struggle for control, this is part of that story that is a miry bog that's thick and sticky. But what follows are the beautiful words of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. As the book of Numbers closes, a collection of retrospective and expectant speeches of Moses is in the book of Deuteronomy as he reflects on the past and looks forward to the future that will be glorious and filled with hope. The first of the scriptures that I want to point out in the book of Deuteronomy is probably one of the most important scriptures there are. It is referred to more often than any other scripture. It is the basis of Jesus' teaching on the commandments. And it comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 4. If you want to read along, I'll pause for a moment if you want to pull Bibles out. So you can quick flip. It's on page 190, for those of you who are doing a pew Bible. For those of you who have your own Bible, I don't know what page it's on. It's Deuteronomy 6, chapter, or verse 4. And this is what Moses has to say to the people. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. This is often referred to as the Shema, which is the most central prayer for the Jewish people. Because the first words are Shema Yisrael. O oh, hear, O oh, Israel. Hear, O oh, Israel. The Lord your God is one Lord. And what follows is the most important commandment to love your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all of yourself. Love your God. And then following near the end of Deuteronomy, as the people are preparing to finally go into that promised land, Moses gives his valedictorian speech to the people of Israel who have been now tempered and changed and transformed by their experience in the wilderness. And so, Moses says this in Deuteronomy 30, beginning with verse 15. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess but if your heart turns away and you are not obedient if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed you will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. Moses, standing in front of the people, giving them that pep talk speech before they're going to enter the land. 
and he says, choose life. Israelites, choose life. Choose to obey your God. Choose to walk in his ways. That is what God is calling us all out to in our own wildernesses. We've been there before. We might be there right now, feeling as though we don't have direction or guidance or know what to do next. And the book of Numbers is there to remind us that when we are in the wilderness, we will emerge from the wilderness, transformed and changed, hearing God's call to choose life. And when we do, following up by walking in the ways of our Lord, so that by God's word, our deeds will reflect that choice. Amen.